Welcome to the webinar on quantum computing applications in financial sector, which is uh, co-organized by the Keene Institute at UNC Chapel Hill and the North Carolina State University IBM Q Hub. I am your host, Eric Geisels. I'm a professor of economics at UNC Chapel Hill and a professor of finance at uh, the Keene Applied Business School. Patrick Dreher, who is the chief scientist at the NC State QHUB, and myself co-organized what I think would have been the very first um, quantum computing fintech symposium, which was scheduled for April 15, but indefinitely postponed due to the COVID-19. The keynote speaker at the event was going to be Stefan Werner. Uh, with the symposium on hold, uh, we felt that we wanted to keep the interest in quantum computing and fintech alive. And we uh, came up with the idea to organize a webinar series and asked uh, Stefan whether he wanted to be our first speaker. And we are delighted that he accepted our invitation. Dr. Stefan Werner is the global leader for quantum finance an optimization and a research staff member in the quantum technologies group of the science and technology department at IBM Research in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping rules. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A tab. Please feel free to write questions during Stefan's presentation. And at the end, of his presentation, we will have a Q&A part of the webinar and field some of the questions uh, that are submitted. I'm delighted to all of you out there for participating in this very first webinar uh, co-organized by the Keene Institute at UNC Chapel Hill and the North Carolina State University IBM Q-Hub. Welcome, and I'd like to pass on the word to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here and give this presentation. And uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the slides? Yes, we're fine. Okay. Great. So yeah, I'd like to give a presentation today on uh, what quantum computing can, um, can achieve in the financial service sector. Um, more, more precisely, the, the talk will be structured in, in two parts. So first, I give a brief introduction to quantum computing in general. How is it different from classical computing? What are the, the, the key features that we're leveraging? And then I talk about applications in, in finance or the, the underlying building blocks that we use there. And I want to, um, to at least give, an, give some idea about uh, what kind of resources are needed to achieve a quantum advantage in these areas for these applications and um, as, as far as this is possible today to give an, an idea about which applications might be a little bit sooner um, and, and for which applications it might we have to wait a, a, a bit longer to really um, realize a quantum advantage. So let's start with the first part, introduction to quantum computing. And um, as, as probably most of you have heard, uh, Moore's law is coming to an end. So what, what does this mean? For the last decades, Moore's law was kind of driving the development of semiconductors. And uh, what it states is that like about every two years, the number of transistors doubles on a, on a chip. And you see this here plotted at the bottom. And uh, the industry was following this very nicely over the last yeah, 50 years. And um, if you look a little bit more detail, then you see some things are starting to slow down. So it's it's uh, it's not exactly um, what it, what it was anymore. Like we are we are uh, increasing the number of logical cores, which is um, which means we need to parallelize things and so on. Um, so we will soon reach a point where we cannot scale classical computing like we did in the past decades. And either it will we will just hit hit some boundaries, or it will become much more expensive. So both will, will play a role. And so we, we, we need to think about other ways to, to increase compute power where we need it. And there are different um, strategies to, to do so. 
One is um, really new designs for classical systems like 3D stacking. At the moment, these transistors are mainly placed two dimensional. So this would be one way. Um, neuromorphic computing, brain inspired computing for certain machine learning tasks. If you think about uh, autonomous driving or things like, like that, that might be uh, interesting. And the third is quantum computing. Now, it's, it's very important to, to understand that these three things are not, um, not necessarily competing, so they are coexisting. For different tasks, a different technology uh, might be best suited. And um, it's, uh, the, the, our goal is to really have these three uh, harmonize with, it, with each other so that, that you, you always can um, take the best technology that's available to, to do a task and that they are interacting where, where necessary and, and, and where possible. So quantum computing. Let's, let's really start with the basics here. What, what's the basic unit of information in quantum computing or in computing in general? Classically, we have the bit. A bit can be zero or one, it's either zero or one. A quantum bit or qubit uh, can, can also be zero or one. If we represent this at the top of the sphere or at the bottom of the sphere, but it actually can take any state on the surface of this sphere. And this is, this is what we call superposition. Um, now, what does this mean, take a state on, on uh, the surface of the sphere? Let's make this a little bit more formal. So for one qubit, we have two basis states, zero, and we usually write it in this uh, cat notation here, which is just a, a basis state in a two-dimensional vector space, and one, which is the other basis state. So it's, it's just linear algebra so far. Then the state of a qubit can be a, uh, a linear combination of these two basis states with the weights alpha and beta. So back to, to standard notation, it's really just the vector alpha of beta, uh, alpha and beta. And alpha and beta can be complex numbers. We have one side condition, that is the, the squares of the absolute values of these numbers have to sum up to one. So this is what we mean by superposition, that we can be in a linear combination of basis states and there is constraint. Um, now to observe the state of a qubit, the only thing we can do is measure it. And uh, if we measure it, then we see a zero with a certain probability. This is now alpha uh, squared, or one with the probability beta squared. And if you want to get a better understanding of what this qubit uh, actually, in, in what state it is, then we have to measure a couple of times, because once we measure, it actually collapses to this basis state. So if I measure a qubit in state zero, it, it will stay in state zero, so it collapses to this state. So that's a little bit different to classical computing. And uh, this, is, this is for one qubit. Now let's assume we have two bits. Two classical bits can be exactly in one of these four basis states. Two qubits can now also be in these four basis states, but now they can also be in, in superpositions of these four basis states, and we can have correlation between the states of the two qubits. And that's what we then call entanglement. Let's look at this again uh, in a little bit more formal way. Um, here we have an entangled state. Now we write the state of the two qubits uh, in one um, cat here. So here we have zero, zero with the weight of one over square root of two plus one, one. So if we would measure this, like let's say we measure only the first qubit, now we see uh, with 50% probability a zero or a one. However, if we observe a zero for the first qubit, then we don't have to measure the second qubit anymore because we know, if, if we know that it's in this state, that they are perfectly correlated. So if we see a zero in the first qubit, then we see a zero in the second qubit. We know it's in this state. Or if we see a, a one in the first qubit, we know the second one is in, um, in state one as well. So this is an entangled state. And this correlation, this is something that cannot be represented using classical bits. Um, this is another example. This is now a not entangled state. So here we have an equal superposition over all four basis states. In this case, I, I measure all four states with equal probability of one over four. Um, this is uh, called the equal superposition state, and this is, uh, is also quite important. Many algorithms actually start in this state. Uh, so, so this is now entanglement and, um, and superposition on a, on a mathematical level. Now, one important point is these um, amplitudes or these weights of the states, they can be negative. Since the probability is the amplitude squared, we don't care about this from, from a measurement point of view. If I would measure this state now with a minus here at the last basis state, I would see exactly the same pattern. However, uh, throughout an algorithm, this is very important because it can enable uh, interference. And let me briefly explain what this means. So 
you know interference maybe from water or from sound waves. So you have different waves. And um, if you add them, then you have some effects where they are amplified, where they are canceling out, and so on. So you, you can have different patterns um, from, from letting different waves interfere. And in quantum computing, we kind of do the same. Here is an example of uh, a three qubit equal superposition state. So you know we have eight basis states. They're all in equal superposition. And we take this one uh, and, and we flag it. And what we then do is we multiply the amplitude of this one by minus one. From a probability point of view, it's again the same. But the actual number here is negative, while the others are positive. Now, one, one operation that we can do in quantum computing is we can um, reflect the different amplitudes at the average of all the amplitudes. And now in this state, the average amplitude is this dashed line. And if you reflect every individual amplitude by the average, then you get to this state. And what you see is now that the, the marked item has a significantly higher amplitude. That means it's measured with a significantly higher probability. And uh, making use of this effect in, in, in a particular way is actually what allows us to achieve a quantum advantage. Because this allows us, if we do this in the right way, to um, amplify the probability of the answers that we are looking for, of the result of an algorithm, and decreasing the probability of all the rest. So if we do this in the right way, then in the end we measure, then we see with a high probability the answer of, of the question we, are, we, are, we want to solve. All right, so there's, there's one interesting fact that I, um, that I didn't mention explicitly, but you already saw it. With one qubit, we have two basis states. With two qubits, four. With three, now we have eight. And what this means is we have an exponential growth of the basis states that you can represent with a set of qubits. So with one qubit, we have just two basis states, and the state is specified by the sum of the two, like a times 0 plus b times 1. With two, we have four basis states, as we've seen before, and they can have individual weights. Um, with the same condition that the square uh, of these amplitudes has to sum up to 1. 3 qubit 8, n qubit 2 to the n. So you see it's the number of basis states and the number of, um, of, of uh, parameters that we need to describe the state of a quantum system with n qubits increases exponentially. And this is, this is really uh, grows very fast. Um, give one example. If we assume we have 275 qubits, then the number of basis states, that's 2 to the 275, is actually larger than the, the number of atoms in the observable universe. So to build a classical computer that can represent um, a number of states that's so large uh, that there's a quite fundamental limitation to, to build something like that. All right, this is, this is in a way where the power comes from, this exponential growth of the, of the basis states, of the, um, of the state space that we can represent combined with interference. However, this also causes uh, uh, some limitations or some problems. Because now assume that you have a quantum computer with n qubits that has, uh, and you need two to the n numbers to specify this state. And let's assume n is very large, like 100. Then you'll, if, if you would have to set all these numbers one by one, you would never be, be done with it. So if you would have to manipulate every element individually, then this would just take too much time. So we have to find clever ways with a very compact input to, to control the quantum computer, to, to load what we want to do, to run the algorithm. And um, if, we, if the result we're looking for is actually the full state of the quantum computer, then this is also too large. We cannot read this out. So it also must be a problem where we have a relatively simple answer that we want to get out. At least it cannot be in the same scale as the number of... Uh, of basis states, because that's just too large. Um, and this is often a problem, and I will come back to that later, that we have an, an input bottleneck and an output bottleneck. But in between, we have a very large compute space. All right, now, how do we actually then program a quantum computer? And uh, uh, one formal way of doing this is via quantum circuits. So here, every line corresponds to a, to a qubit. And you can kind of read this like a um, like a music chart, and uh, then we have different gates. We have here two qubit gates that actually entangle two qubits, and then we have single qubit gates that change uh, the state of the single qubit, and, and then in the end we have a measurement of the qubit that gives us a zero or one. Um, this 
quantum circuits are a nice way of, of drawing uh, what's, what's happening. And then in reality, they are realized uh, via microwave uh, pulses. And I come briefly back to that in a bit. Um, but, but you can imagine that such a graphical way is not so nice to um, actually write more complex programs. And that's why we uh, introduced Qiskit, which is our open source Python framework to write quantum circuits, simulate them on classical hardware, and also send them to our real quantum devices over the, over the cloud. So I will also um, show a little bit more on that later on what can be done with this. Now, I mentioned this input output bottleneck, but, but overall, what's the requirement on a quantum algorithm such that it can be seen as, as uh, efficient or which are the different things that we need to take into account here? Um, first is the number of different circuits that you need to run within one algorithm should not grow too fast, should not be too large. Um, then the number of qubits per circuit, of course, shouldn't be too big. The number of gates per circuit shouldn't grow too, too fast. If that's too long, then actually there might not be any, any quantum advantage. And the number of measurements. So if, if you need to measure this, this um, output in the end too precisely, and for some applications, some, some problem like that uh, uh, may appear, then this can also actually uh, impede quantum advantage. So these are all things that have to be taken into account. And that's uh, one of the reasons that makes it a bit difficult to actually um, estimate when quantum advantage will happen the first time, when we have a practical advantage derived from a quantum computer. But um, we'll come back to that later. Now, very briefly, how does a quantum computer look like? Um, here on the left, you see a printed circuit board. Uh, and in the middle is actually um, the, 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 the chip with the qubit. And you see the hand behind. This is not very, very large. And this, I don't know, I assume this is a five qubit chip. Um, then this is placed here at the bottom of the chandelier, which is the, the inner part of a dilution refrigerator. So this is cooling down the qubits. To, to very cold temperatures, like it's 15 millikelvins, like slightly above the absolute zero. Then this chandelier sits in inside of this dilution refrigerator, which is shielded to protect the qubits, which are very fragile from, from uh, also radiation and so on. And then they're standing in our data centers. And here you see actually two quantum computers. And um, by now we have, uh, almost 20 devices, I think it's 19 devices that, I, that I've seen this morning when I checked, that are available um, to our partners through the cloud. And uh, these devices range from, from one to actually 53 qubits. And, uh, and yeah, some of them are publicly available via Qiskit and some of them, uh, our premium devices are available to our, to our partners. All right, now I, I introduced the, the abstract concept of a qubit. And I, I gave you a little bit an idea of how you, how you uh, can modify them, what, what effects we leverage to, um, to achieve a quantum advantage eventually. But it's a little bit more subtle than that. And the point is, the qubits that we can build today, the physical qubits, they are not perfect. So there's errors involved, there's noise. They're not doing exactly what we, what we want them to do, or they are losing their state after a while. So there are different effects that um, they need to be taken into account. So you cannot just run an arbitrary algorithm on today's um, quantum computers due to noise and errors. And um, uh, we introduced a metric to actually measure the power of a quantum computer, which you call the quantum volume. And the quantum volume is a single number that takes all these different things into account that actually influence the, the, the performance of a quantum computer and um, translates this into the single benchmark number. Uh, this allows us to track progress over, over time if we, if we um, uh, improve any of these and also identify the bottleneck that's currently limiting the performance of a system. Now, eventually, so, so this is what we, what we call um, noisy or near-term quantum computing. Um, eventually, what we want to do is we want to have error-corrected quantum computers. And... Uh, the point here is that these errors and noise that I mentioned, they can be significantly suppressed by using error correcting codes. What this means is you take many physical qubits, you use such an error correcting code, and then you use them to encode uh, logical qubits. And there's quite some overhead. So estimates today range from a few hundred to a thousand physical qubits to realize one logical qubit. 
And if we then have a quantum computer with many logical qubits, then this is what we call a fault-tolerant quantum computer. And with that, we have um, we can run algorithms where we really have, have performance guarantees and there's a lot of theory behind and where we can really assume the, um, this mathematical model that I introduced at the very beginning without any errors or noise. All right, that's about um, quantum computing, a brief introduction, how things work and what, what are like the important uh, um, phenomena that we leverage. Now I'd like to talk about applications and particularly applications in finance. This is um, organized in, in three parts. First part is machine learning, so where we want to generate insights from data. The second part is uh, focusing on optimization, where like given the model um, on, on some situations, we want to find an optimal decision, we want to make uh, the optimal decision. And the third part is on simulation, particularly Monte Carlo simulation, uh, where we want to analyze uncertainty, mainly statistical uncertainty, but by doing different uh, like what-if scenarios, we can also check uh, what happens in, in when, when certain events take place or don't take place. All right, let's, let's start with machine learning. And uh, here I want to show this picture again, because in, in machine learning, it's particularly important. Many known machine learning or quantum machine learning algorithms that have very nice theoretical properties have this input-output problem. So they, it actually proves that, say, once you are within the quantum uh, state, then you can do things exponentially faster than you would ever hope to do them classically. However, uh, to load the problem or to load the data or to read out the result can, can already be as expensive as solving said problem classically. So before you can even run your quantum computer, your classical computer would, would already be done with solving the problem. And this is something that you always have to analyze very carefully and take into account to, um, uh, to make sure that in a certain application, there is really uh, a potential quantum advantage. In the following uh, two applications that I want to, to mention in this machine learning section, um, this, we, we don't have that problem because we don't want to achieve a quantum advantage by doing something faster. We want to achieve it by doing something better. All right, what do I mean by that? So first application is, uh, is binary classification. And so we, we assume we have a labeled set of data, uh, data points, um, where some points are in one class and some points are in the other class. We want to use that to train a classifier such that a new data point, um, that we can decide whether this should be in the one class or in the other. Uh, this has plenty of applications, just to name a few, we have fraud detection, credit risk rating, customer segmentation. And to do this classically, what you could do is you could use a support vector machine. The support vector machine computes this hyperplane that's indicated here by the, by the white line in the middle that splits the two classes in, in, in yeah, left and right of the hyperplane. And in this example, if we now um, get a new data point, that would be a quite, quite good, that would do a quite good job uh, if you just say, okay, the new data point is left of, the, of this hyperplane or right, and uh, put it in the one class or the other. The problem is if data is not linearly separable. So if data is not looking as nice as in this picture, like in this example. And uh, what you can do classically here is you can use a feature map. So you take this data, you map it to a high dimensional space, and you see now a hyperplane can be used again to separate those two classes, and you can use this for your classification. And um, our colleagues from IBM Research in, in Yorktown, um, they suggested to not do this classically, but actually use a quantum feature map. So you take a classical data point, and then you apply a quantum feature map that maps it to a significantly higher dimensional quantum state. And now remember that, that the, the state space that we can represent is exponentially higher dimensional than the number of, number of qubits. So we have a really large compute space. And if you find a reasonable mapping, then we can, um, we can represent possibly way more features or we can, we can have a, a much better classification in this higher dimensional feature space. And uh, here's an outline of how such an algorithm could, could work. So here we have a, a couple of qubits again. And we have the first block here, which is the feature map. So this takes a single data point and maps it to a quantum state. So after you apply this block, you have a quantum state 
that in some way represents the data point you uh, were interested in. Then we have this orange block. And this is similar to a neural network. So this is also parameterized, but these parameters we train over all our, our training set. Then we measure. For every measurement, we get a zero or one. And then we assign a label. So for example, we could uh, use a parity mapping. If there's an even number of, of ones here, we assign the one label. If there's an odd number, we assign the other label. And since this is probabilistic, we repeat this a couple of times such that this label assignment is, um, is reliable. And then we have a black box that takes a data point, has some parameters, and gives us a classification. And then we can train this um, in, a, in, a, in a standard training loop as you would do uh, train a classical neural network, for example. So this is one way how a quantum computer might um, achieve a, a quantum advantage for this classification task. And since you see that this is running in a, in a classical training loop and you just replace this black box by a call to the quantum computer, you see that this is not necessarily going any faster than training a, a classical system. But since we have a much um, richer feature space here in between, um, this might lead to a better quality of the classification. So uh, this has been published last year in Nature and, and tested on, uh, on some artificial data set where, it could, where, where our colleagues could show that this works really well for this small test case. Um, I want to now also show another application where we tested this on a, um, I don't want to say a real world data set, but it's a data set derived from a real world data set. So what we took is uh, some fundamental data from 250 companies. And um, this included the income statement, the balance sheet, and uh, a corporate rating. And you see here um, a histogram of, of how many companies were in which uh, rating. And then, because we're talking about binary reclassification, we said we want to train a classifier that tells us, given this fundamental data, should the rating be a three or higher or below. And um, since this data set in overall is like 250 dimensional. We had to do a principal component analysis to significantly and compress that. So in the end, we had a, a two dimensional data set. That's why I, why I meant um, this is not necessarily a, a, a real data set, but it's derived from that. Um, and then we use this compressed data set to test different classifiers. And that's what you see here. Um, first, we tested a standard support vector machine. And the x-axis here is the classification success or the accuracy. So this is the, the number of, of uh, data points that were classified correctly. Um, and you see here, the average is not, not that good. And this is the spread, like the minimum classification. Um, we did 100 uh, random training sets here. Um, minimum, maximum, the average classification. Then we tried a random forest, which on average improves. Extreme gradient boost, which again improves. And um, the last. Uh, method here on the top was this quantum variational classifier, where you can see that this performed best on average on this test case. Now, we didn't tweak any of those. We just took them out of the box as they come in, in the Python implementations like learn and applied them. So this is just to illustrate what kind of advantage we, we, um, uh, we think can be achieved in the long run with these kind of techniques. So this is um, it's really the, the accuracy of a classifier. Now I want to show a similar result. This is a very recent result, um, which actually will be published on archive tomorrow. So this is on variational quantum Boltzmann machines. And this is something that also can do um, uh, discriminative learning, as I will, will mention in a bit, um, but also generative learning to represent distributions that you have only implicitly given by data and things like that. So what's a, what's a quantum Boltzmann machine? A quantum Boltzmann machine actually encodes um, the, the trained knowledge in the parameters of a Hamiltonian. So this is kind of an object that encodes an energy um, or, or the dynamics of a system. Then what you do is you generate a Gibbs state, that's a particular state derived from this Hamiltonian. And here we use a variational algorithm called Wachheit or a variational quantum imaginary time evolution. And then we sample from this skip state, and this skip state should correspond to, um, to what we want to see, whether it's like the, the labeling or whether this is the distribution we are interested in. And what we do here is we combine um, this Wark height together with automatic differentiation to actually um, get uh, not only the, the Gibbs state, but also the gradient 
such that we can have an efficient training. So we can use this to get the gradient of the loss function when we have this training cycle. We, as I mentioned, we tested this um, for a, at, a, at a small scale. First, just to give the preparation as a proof of concept. This was on real hardware, and that, that worked uh, on up to six qubits. Then generative learning, where we wanted to learn some statistic uh, from, from a given state. We used here a classical simulation of a quantum computer. And then discriminative learning. And here we used a, a, um, a credit card fraud data set. And this is based on synthetic uh, toy credit card data, credit card fraud data. So um, a colleague of ours uh, did, does research in, in generating in, uh, synthetic credit card fraud data to train classical AI systems. And he helped us in preparing such a, a data set uh, at a smaller scale that we can use for our test cases here. So this had three features plus a label that's fraud or not, 500 training data points and 250 test data points. And we compared this to um, a couple of classical techniques. And again, here we didn't do any, any hyperparameter optimization, but we took the algorithms as well as the hyperparameters as they were given in this tutorial from scikit-learn. And uh, what you see here is now accuracy, recall, precision, F1 score for all the different uh, methods for this data set. And um, here you see that the variational quantum Boltzmann machine actually performs best over all of them. And that's, they might, you might be able to improve some of them, but it gives you an, an idea of what we want to achieve here in the long run. All right, now the, the question that always comes at that stage is when do we expect the quantum advantage for these types of applications? And um, I, I can tell you right away, we don't have an, uh, uh, such a good answer to that yet. And I won't be able to give you any date or, 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 or period of time when, when this will happen. But I can try to put things a bit into context such that you can um, uh, better put this in, in place given where we are today and what, what might be necessary to, to achieve a quantum, computer, a quantum advantage. So first, we have these two algorithms um, or these two examples of algorithms from which we know that they are near-term compatible. What I mean by that is that they may be useful already without error correction. So um, we maybe for those it might be uh, sufficient to apply some error mitigation techniques, but we don't need um, the, the error correction that I mentioned before, where we need these logical qubits that are built of many physical qubits. So that's already, already good. Um, then if we look at what types of systems are difficult to simulate classically, then um, with like 50 plus qubits, this in general becomes very difficult. So even on, on high performance computing systems, this is uh, we're running into, into problems if we get larger than, than like 50 or 60. So one could hope that with like, let's say around 100 qubits, we may be able to achieve a quantum advantage in this range over these problems. Um, but I added this part here, qubits of sufficient quality. And this is because of noise errors and so on. So if they, um, if they are too noisy, then you won't be able to really entangle all 100 qubits with each other uh, because uh, at the end, you'll only measure white noise. So what is exactly the sufficient quality? That's something that we haven't fully understood yet. When is this? when we reach this point where we can have a practical advantage from quantum computing um, that, that we, we don't know. But um, with, uh, since we are at 50 qubits today, we think that this is in the next couple of years, it shouldn't be too far away that we see a first quantum advantage. Now, will this first quantum advantage be in machine learning? That's again, difficult to say, but, but maybe. So from, from this analysis, um, uh, it, 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 it could be possible. There's no particular um, uh, immediate showstopper from, from looking at these dimensions. All right, next topic I'd like to talk about is optimization. And uh, here we look into a particular class of problems, that's QBOS or quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. So here we, we have binary decision variables. So it's zero, one, yes, no, on, off, or buy, don't buy decisions. Um, we can only have linear equality constraints because linear equality constraints can be added as a quadratic penalty term. And then we are back to an un quadratic unconstrained optimization problem. Um, and, uh, but, but this might 
sound restrictive, but it still covers a, a large um, set of problems, difficult problems like portfolio management, traveling salesman problem, max card, and, and, and many more. I will illustrate uh, a bit in the next slides how this uh, has been used for portfolio optimization. So where we assume we have uh, some uh, investment universe, some model for the expected return and the, the risk, and then we want to find the efficient frontier, uh, like where we, where we balance um, risk and expected return in the, in the best way for, for us. All right, these algorithms are also uh, near-term uh, quantum optimization heuristics, and they, they follow a similar pattern than or a similar structure than what I mentioned before for this variational um, classifier. Here we also have a, a, a training loop in a way, or a feedback loop between a classical computer and a quantum computer. And what we is essentially do is we have some parameters that we train classically, and we use the quantum computer to e evaluate the objective function. Um, what we do is we encode the problem in this operator H, and then we train the quantum state that achieves the minimum energy, and the minimum energy then corresponds to the optimal solution of the problem we are interested in. Circuits could look like that. So you have three qubits, and where each qubit corresponds to a decision variable. So if we measure a qubit in a zero state, then this would correspond to setting the variable to zero. If we um, measure it in the one state, it would correspond to uh, setting the variable to one. Now we have here um, parameterized gates. So these are single qubit gates, and we train these parameters. Then we have some entanglement block. This is entangling the qubits. And then we have, again, parameterized single qubit gates, and this is repeated. Then in the end, we, we, we measure. And the more often we can repeat this, the, the more um, or the richer the representation representation capabilities of such a, a variational circuit are, and the more parts of our state space we can explore, and um, uh, the, the better the solution hopefully gets. All right, we, we tested this for portfolio, portfolio optimization, where we assume really a mean variance or Markowitz problem. So we have um, some expected assets, as expected returns for the assets. Here we had five. We have covariance matrix um, between the expected of, between the returns for the assets. And then we want to, uh, to maximize the expected return minus the, the weighted risk of the, of the portfolio. And uh, this we, we tested on actually even up to six um, assets or qubits. And that we could, could uh, find this efficient frontier for different budgets, where the budget constraint here says uh, you, you should pick one, two, three, four, or, or five um, assets out of the, in this case, five. All right, this was, was an application. Now, I, I mentioned before that we have uh, Qiskit and that we have this Python framework to program quantum computers. For optimization, we actually just released a new optimization module within Qiskit. And I want to very briefly uh, walk you through that so that you get an idea of what can be done with that today. So first, we have um, a representation layer that's compatible to, to classical frameworks like Cplex or DOCplex. This is a high-level modeling language that, that is already established in practice classically, and you can use this and directly then call the quantum algorithm to, to um, try to solve these problems, of course, at a small scale for the time being. Um, then all of them have a, a, a similar interface or the same interface, so they are all used the same with different algorithms. Then we have different algorithms for different problem classes and uh, also some classical solvers. The whole thing is built in a, in a very modular and flexible way such that um, it facilitates research because you can exchange the different components, uh, prototyping because you can only just um, implement a certain, a certain part and then leverage the infrastructure that we provide, um, but also testing validation benchmarking because you have these classical solvers that you can use for comparison or to, as, as long as the problems are still small, to, to get you the optimal solution and so on. And um, this sits on top of the core functionality of Qiskit that provides the circuit handling, the simulation, the access to the real hardware. So this is a very convenient way, and this is also kind of how we um, uh, how we think this this should be used in the in the future. All right. Now, same question as before for machine learning: When do we expect the quantum advantage for optimization? Now, first point: these combinatorial optimization problems. Um, are classically very difficult because the number of possible combinations grows exponentially with the number of variables. Uh, so we often have to rely to heuristics. 
uh, to find reasonable solutions and there's no guarantee on, on the performance classically. Now, what size is actually difficult? Uh, or what does difficult mean? And there's a, a nice benchmark library that, um, that you can find here. And uh, a bit simplified, what, what this classification of this library says is problems around a thousand variables, and here we say discrete variables, are usually easy, where easy means you can solve them on your um, desktop computer in less than an hour. Uh, around 10,000 is hard, and around 100,000 is usually open. Where hard means we have found an optimal solution, or we can find an optimal solution, maybe using high performance computing, and open means we, we don't know anything. So I mentioned before that we have a one to one relation between binary variables and qubits. If you bring these two things together, then you see that um, before you can expect a quantum advantage, it, you, it's very likely that we have to look at a problem which is uh, hard here because otherwise you can solve it in reasonable time classically. However, this is around, let's say, 1,000 to 10,000 qubits uh, uh, variables, but that, because of the one-to-one -one relation, also translates into qubits. So here we probably need a bit more qubits than for the machine learning until we can expect the quantum um, advantage because we, I mean, there's, I don't know, 70 years of research or something like that classically to, to try to find good solutions to these problems. And um, this just means that, that the, the size of problems that we still can handle somehow is a bit, bit larger. However, um, we, we have these uh, near-term quantum algorithms. So if we get to a, to a quantum algorithm of that size, then um, we, we may be able to have an advantage. There are also heuristics, so we still cannot say anything right now. But um, for many of these problems, even if we can only get a small improvement, that can already have a huge impact. Particularly in finance, you usually have a huge leverage. And um, that's, that's already quite, quite nice. And uh, the last point here, there are also quantum algorithms that have a proven speed up. So we don't only know uh, quantum heuristics, but also some algorithms with, uh, where we know that they, will be, um, that they may be faster than, than classical algorithms they very likely require error correction, so this will be a bit further out. Good. So with this, I'm coming to the, to the last area I want to discuss, simulation, Monte Carlo simulation. And um, first, what, what do I mean by that, or what's the problem we want to solve? So we assume we have some given distribution, and we are interested in, in properties of this distribution that can be the expected value. We talk, for example, about pricing but also some risk metrics like the value at risk or the, the conditional value at risk or expected shortfall, like these tail measures. And uh, one way to do this classically is Monte Carlo simulation. That's quite a universal way, which is the reason why it's um, quite, quite popular for many tasks. And Monte Carlo simulation doesn't scale very nicely. Um, that means to improve the estimation error by one order of magnitude, you need to increase your sample size by two orders of magnitude. That's the, the standard uh, scaling from the central limit theorem. This is illustrated here. That's the, the orange line for the number of, of samples, like how many, many samples from this distribution we take, how the error behaves. Now, with quantum computing, we have shown that we can achieve a quadratic speed up. And that means that instead of um, this one over square root of number of samples scaling, we have a one over n sample, uh, scaling. So to increase or to improve the estimation error by one order of magnitude, we only have to increase the number of samples by one order of magnitude. And this might uh, imply then eventually that where today you need millions of samples classically, you only need a few thousand samples on a quantum computer. And we demonstrated this already on, on some small problems, toy problems uh, as, as proof of principles. Now, how does this algorithm look like? And um, this algorithm is leveraging a, like a, a fundamental core building block, which is called quantum amplitude estimation. What you see here is a circuit diagram for the canonical quantum amplitude estimation, which has been published here in the year 2000 by Brassard et al. Here, we have two sets of qubits. At the top, we have a, a set of evaluation qubits. They will show the, the estimation result in the end. And at the bottom, uh, we have state qubits, which do the actual simulation. Then we run here the, the samples, and then with every sampling here, we extract a little bit of information to the state uh, evaluation qubits. We do an uh, inverse quantum Fourier transform, and we measure, and with a high probability, we get the, the result we're interested in. So simplified, 
The actual simulation happens at the bottom here. And this red box is the overhead to extract the results. And now, mid of last year, colleagues from us uh, from uh, Tokyo, they published this paper where they showed that actually you can drop this upper part, you can focus on the bottom part. Or they could simplify the circuits quite a bit. And they could also show that this still achieves quite a good performance. But there was not, no rigorous theory about the, the, this performance yet. Then a bit later last year, there was another paper which also showed a different approach of taking only this bottom part of the circuit. And they also provided a rigorous theory which actually achieves the asymptotic optimum. But practically, this algorithm is not, um, not that, that, that useful because it has really large constants. Um, but it's, it's still the only algorithm that achieves asymptotically the optimal scaling. The others still have a log factor, which in practice doesn't matter, but, but so this is still a, a very nice result. And uh, then later last year, we, we introduced um, this iterative bottom up to the estimation, which now also focuses on this bottom part and doesn't need this, this red box, has a good performance and a rigorous theory. And we also implemented all of these algorithms to, to actually have a comparison in empirical comparison, where the x-axis here is the number of oracle calls, so that's kind of the number of samples, uh, the number of, of steps you have to do. And on the y-axis, you have the estimation error, both uh, with uh, log scales. In blue, you have the reference for the classical Monte Carlo. In red, you have the, uh, the technique um, that achieves the asymptotically optimal scaling. Um, but you see this is this is even um, takes more operations than than classical monte carlo to get to a very small error and uh, so if you would go way further to the to the right then at some point the red one should be the best but um, that won't be at any, any practically relevant scale and this uh, light blue line is the canonical absolute estimation and then in orange we have the um, the one from from tokyo um, that uh, uh, was the first one without this overhead, and you see this performs very well. But at some point, it's getting numerically tricky to really to really run this. And in green, then we have um, our technique from from last year that that uh, runs very nicely, also for higher accuracies, and um, uh, and we can we can prove this, we can prove nice bounds for that. So this is about the the algorithm, and you see that um, in 2000 this algorithm was introduced, but then it took about 20 years to to um, significantly improve it. Of course, there was then more interested in, in improving it in the last years, um, but this significantly reduced the the requirements in terms of number of qubits in depth, uh, that is number of gates that that are required. Now that's the 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 abstract algorithm and. For these type of problems, we also have this, this data loading issue. And uh, here, I want to give an example of, uh, of a recent result where we could kind of overcome this. So we could recently show that for stochastic processes, as long as you can evaluate them, as long as you can compute the transition probability sufficiently classically, we know how to load them efficiently to a quantum model such that you can use amplitude estimation. So here we could kind of, um, uh, show that there is not this input bottleneck because we know how to model things efficiently. We tested this for the Heston model, that's a stochastic volatility model, where you have one stochastic process driving the volatility of a stock price and another one driving a uh, depending stochastic process that's driving the actual stock price. And we used this for a uh, European call option pricing. And this is just an, a sketch of the, of the circuit that we used. All right, overall, we, we tested this algorithm on, on different problems. Like last year, we, we um, analyzed uh, how to, to model particular options in such that you can use amplitude estimation. And uh, here we, we cover um, all types of uh, Europe or all European type of options. But by, by European, I mean options where you only have one decision point whether you ex exercise or not. So American type of options are, um, uh, are different because there you, you can exercise at an arbitrary point in time, then it's kind of a control problem. So here we only do um, estimation of a, of a certain price because the, the policy, whether you exercise or not for European type of options is, is trivial because you just look at the very end whether the stock price is above, is above the strike price or not. 
We also tested this for credit risk analysis at a small scale where you want to, where you have a large uh, portfolio of, of uh, loans, for example, and you want to estimate the risk, uh, the default risk that you, that you face. And um, here we actually did an estimate of how long this would run on a, on a quantum computer, assuming that we have a fault tolerant large enough quantum computer. And we could show that this can, can really be run in, in a few minutes for a million assets, um, which uh, is likely to run uh, hours or, or longer on a, on a classical computer to achieve the same accuracy. All right, um, again, question, when do we expect a quantum advantage here? Um, it's, it's a bit difficult or more difficult to say here. Um, we, we saw that these uh, better algorithms actually significantly reduced the hardware requirements. So we, we, in the last year, we made a, um, a small step towards this um, that, that, that might help to, to get this a bit earlier. However, the, the resulting quantum circuits will be very deep. So that means you have to run a lot of gates on, on your qubits. And that means that we are rather sure that this requires um, error correction. So this requires a fault tolerant quantum computer. However, this, this um, algorithm, this quantum absolute estimation, is extremely universal because in the end, what you do is you do numerical integration. That's, that's all you, you do, whether this is pricing, um, risk analysis, or in the end, this can also be formulated as, always be formulated as numerical integration. This has implications like everywhere. However, if we, um, if we take all the things we know today about, um, about error correction and logical qubits and these things and fault tolerant quantum computer, then we expect that to achieve a quantum advantage, um, we likely require something of like the order of a million physical qubits to realize a fault tolerant quantum computer that has enough logical qubits such that we can run amplitude estimation for a problem where we can achieve an advantage, um, a practical advantage using quantum computing. All right, so to conclude this, um, there are plenty of applications in finance and also beyond where, where um, quantum computing can eventually have an, have an impact. But it is very difficult to make a prediction when this will happen. Um, I think the, the order in which I presented these topics uh, is what I think might also be the order in which we see an advantage. Um, I, I showed you why machine learning might be a little bit easier than optimization, because here we can um, do rather, rather well to a certain point classically, and why these simulation problems or numerical integration problems will likely be last, because they require fault tolerance. Um, however, like we've also seen that this research in algorithms can significantly reduce the requirements or improve the performance. So it's it might be sooner than we, than we think due to jumps in algorithmic development or error correction or error mitigation development, and of course, development in the quantum hardware themselves. And, and last, we have already first software packages like this optimization module in Kiskit that it makes it extremely easy to, to try and to test first thing, even if you're not a quantum computing expert. Um, Kiskit has really a lot of functionality by now, also in chemistry and finance, uh, optimization, as I mentioned, machine learning. Um, more application modules like the optimization module will be released throughout the year. So this is um, something you, you should have a look uh, if you are interested in that. And with this, um, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to take the questions now. Thank you, Stefan. That was great. Now we have a mixed uh, mixture of questions. Uh, some of them technical, some of them more practical. Um, let me start with one. What may be the reason for the existence of noise in computing at or above 50 qubits? Uh, the noise is not only present at 50 qubits. The noise is already present at a single qubit. And um, I think the reason is that, that we are really operating here at the, at the limit of what, what's possible. So we, these, these qubit systems, um, they are operating at, at like close to the temperature, uh, to the absolute zero temperature, right? And, and um, that's, that's to, um, to, to make this 
these quantum effects that we leverage actually happen and to, to um or to, to be able to control them somewhat. So it's it's really at the at the limit of what 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 we can do and controlling that that we control that that we can control that at all is already um quite a quite a miracle to me actually. Yeah. Well, let me insert the question of mine actually and then we'll move on to this. Uh, let me talk about machine learning examples uh, and how we think about uh, quantum advantage. Uh, the examples you gave uh, arguably are sort of toy examples in terms of data. There, there is, I think, 200 companies, and then there was uh, also something like 200 uh, credit card uh, data points. When we talk about um, quantum advantage, um, are we talking basically about the computational part, where there is a first dimensionality reduction that takes place perhaps on a classical computer and then feeds into the quantum machine? Is that, is that sort of when we're talking about quantum advantage, we're, we're still having uh, the data dimensionality issue being resolved first on a classical computer? Is that, is that sort of where we're heading? Um, that, that's a, um, definitely a possible scenario. So a quantum computer is a is is not a big data machine. So a quantum computer will, and that's because of this input output bottleneck that I mentioned before. Quantum computing can do um, difficult computational tasks, but if um, loading the data is a big part of your problem already classically, then it's unlikely to be a problem that you want to solve on a quantum computer. So having, and, and I mentioned at the very beginning that, that we think that these different technologies need to, um, need to be combined, you need to, to, to uh, combine them to have the synergies to exploit the best from each world. So it's very likely to have a classical pre-processing, um, then send this to a quantum computer to do some machine learning tasks and then interpret the result on a classical computer again. So I think that's, that's very, very likely, um, a very likely scenario. One of the questions actually relates to that. Can the variation of classification apply to any data set? How about iterative, iterative solution or semi-definite problems where you only start up with a guest so, solution uh, and iterate until convergence? That's sort of what we are as well talking about essentially, right? So I, I didn't fully understand this, this question. So it's a question, can the variation of classification apply to any data set how about iterative solutions uh, on, or semi-definite problems? So I, I guess we are talking about moving back and forth uh, between the classical computer and, and, uh, and the quantum machine, which is... Yeah. Um, so, so that's how this, how this works. Yeah, if you want to do a kind of a, a warm start or something like that, if I understand this correctly here, that's, um, that's possible to some extent. Like if you trained your system already, Previously, then you have these classical parameters that specify your quantum circuit. And if you then get new data, like um, every day you get some new data and you want to keep your, your classifier up to date, then you don't have to start from scratch. You can start training from the parameters that you that you had from the previous run. So that, that's to, to this is the extent this is possible. Yeah. Another question uh, I think relates to the broader issue about the competing technologies that are around uh, for quantum. Uh, the question is, is IBM seeing any alternatives in technology that offer trade-off advantages in some areas over a super cool quantum machine? Um, That's a tough I mean, question. There are different, different technologies, whether this is um, spin systems or iron traps or things like that. Right. I think um, some have longer coherence times meaning they don't lose their state as fast, but on the other hand, the operations to run on them take much longer. Others are more difficult to, to actually build. Other technologies have not been demonstrated at all. It's, I think at that point in time, it's very difficult um, to say. Like I, I, I would say nobody knows today how a million qubit system will look like. It probably will be none of the technologies that we know today, but the superconducting qubits that we are using are the ones that are um, so far, the uh, furthest, or have the, the progress the furthest. So we have these 53 uh, physical qubits. 
um, while other technologies are, are significantly smaller. But at some point, that definitely can be can be true that that another technology is very good for a particular type of application. And uh, the reason is that the different technologies have different gates that you can apply. So in, in our technology, we have um, actually a, a uni kind of universal single qubit gate and then a single type of two qubit gate to entangle qubits. However, it's known that this is um, a universal basis set. So with this gate, you can represent everything. And other technologies have different basis sets, so they can have different uh, operations. And that's similar to classical computing, actually, where you have, uh, depending on your processor you have, or architecture, you have different set of basis operations. And that's why, why one um, processor is more efficient to do some tasks than another. That, that's actually the same for the, for the qubit technologies, but um, it's, it's a bit too early to say, I think, uh, which one is um, like leaving all the technical difficulties uh, outside, which one is the most efficient for a certain uh, task. And to some extent, the problem is also that we, we still have to build better compilers, actually compilers that take an abstract circuit and then compile it or transpile it uh, to the circuit that can be rep represented or run on a particular hardware. It's a, it's a good question, but I think, don't think that there's a, a, the final answer yet <laughs> known. Uh, we're kind of running out of time. We have a few more questions, but uh, we're we happy to uh, uh, forward them to you. Uh, two weeks from now, we have a second seminar in this series. It will be uh, Isaiah Hu, who, will be, who is a senior economist at the Swedish Central Bank, and he will talk about quantum technology for economists. To all of you who participated, thank you, and particularly thank you, Stefan. This was absolutely great. Thank you very much.